the Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you afraid of what might happen to your family if something should happen to you? Are you afraid that your children may never enjoy the advantages of a college education? Are you afraid of being a burden on others when you reach 60 or 65? Then let me assure you, you can take these fears out of your future. How? Consult your friendly, helpful neighbor, your local Equitable Society representative. In about 13 minutes, I'd like to tell you more about him and how he may help you, too, enjoy the many advantages of membership in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Impersonation. Its title, The Traveling Swindle. The criminal mind, while warped and maladjusted, still functions in much the same manner as any other mind. It observes, it memorizes, it forms opinions. And one of these opinions seems to be that the American public is very gullible. Basing many of their activities on this theory, criminals constantly endanger the public through the evils of fraud and misrepresentation. Many of these crimes seem more serious than others. But from the able-bodied beggar who masquerades as a cripple to the fly-by-night stockbroker, their stock in trade is fraud. And as in tonight's case, your law enforcement agencies must depend on your cooperation to wipe it out. Tonight's FBI file opens in a Midwestern state. It is late afternoon. A travel-worn sedan labors faithfully along a tree-shaded road as it pulls a heavy house trailer behind it. In the front seat of the car sits a man and woman, both in their early 40s. In the back seat, their two young children play a game to pass the time. I see something green. The grass. No. Those leaves. No, hurry, we're almost past it. Door on that old house up there. No, and I win, we passed it. That big signpost back there, Smarty. I didn't see no signpost. There oh, wasn't green. Laura. Was no, too. no, was keep was your voices too. down or I'm going to send you back to the trailer. Ooh. Your papa's tired and he's driven a long way. But it was green, huh? Never you mind. You just sit there and be quiet for a spell. Smarty. A considerate wife is the nearest thing to peace a man can find on this old earth. It's just you look so tired, Herb. Well, when you work for the government, you keep right on the job, tired or not, Maudie. That's why they only take men willing to sacrifice a little personal comfort. Mm, your brother Fred don't seem to be sacrificing no comfort. Sleeping back there in the trailer while you drive all the way. Oh, Maudie. Fred's new with the government and never try to rush what experience can teach. That's my sentiment. You're a good man, Herb. Government's lucky to have a man like you. There's the camp, Papa. I seen it first. I just wasn't killed. Just Earl, not, no, no, you, no, you, you not, can't just kill it. That looks like a spot right over there, Herb. And so it does. Why didn't you I, I'll so just ease her in past the tree. Oh, look out of the tree, Papa. Oh, he can see it, Smarty. There. All right, now, one of you kids run back and wake up your Uncle Fred. I'll go. And I'm already going. You told me to go. Both of you go. Go on. Ah, uh, uh, look at those trees. Nothing brings a man closer to nature than traveling, Marty. Do you and Fred have to go to work right away, Herb? Couldn't you wait and get a good night's sleep? Marty. The government don't hire fellows who'd rather sleep than stick on the job. You count on us being here long, Herb? Uh, it all depends. Two or three days, maybe. Got to see a man back in Marysville at the Star Hotel. If everything's oh, in shape, we should... Bob, you should have called me earlier. Have a nice sleep, Fred. I've been reading. I... Gee, I'm sorry, Herb. Well, it never hurts to try to improve your mind, Fred. 
Yeah, Marty, get some water while we unhitch the trailer, will you? All right. I'll want to wash up. When you're in our kind of work, appearance means an awful lot. Yes, sir, gentlemen, double room. Well, no, we'd like to see the manager, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> I am the manager and the owner. <laughs> you see, we're a little short of help this time of the year. Yes, and now, uh, you're Mr... Uh, Clinton, Harvey Clinton. Well, we're government men, Mr. Clinton, here to look at your books. Y oh. Uh, my badge? Oh, uh, well, nothing wrong, is there? Oh, it's just a routine check, Mr. Clinton, as much to your advantage as ours... Now, if you don't mind showing us the books, we'll get right to work. Well, now, I don't mind you looking at my books, but I'm afraid I'll have to stay on the desk here for at least another hour. Mr. Clinton, a man never does himself a bit of good by being always in a rush. My partner, Mr. Johnson, here can come back in about an hour. Fine, fine. And I'll do all that I can to help them. Uh, goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Fred, I wish you'd get a more pleasant expression on your face when we talk to men like that. Man can't trust another man if he looks like the face of doom. Well, I didn't feel so pleasant, Herb. You almost scared the life out of me pulling out that badge. Why not just keep using that plain leather wallet? People only look at the wallet anyway, Fred. Badge there just gives it an extra little touch. Well, if you're going to use one, why can't I have one, too? I have no objection to that. Only I hope you're hungry tomorrow morning. It takes ten box tops to get a badge like this one. Meanwhile, at the FBI field office in the nearby city, Special Agent Taylor approaches the desk of Supervisor Tom Fulton. Hello, Tom. You sent for me? Oh, yes, Jim. I have a report here on two men posing as federal agents. They flashed phony credentials at a hay and grain store over in West Barrington. It's run by a man named Lloyd. And Lloyd didn't bother to check their credentials, huh? No, they pretended to check the books, then told Lloyd they were disallowing some claims he'd made for business expense. And they got big-hearted and told Lloyd they could make a settlement, is that it? That's it. Mm -hmm. Lloyd paid him $45. How'd he find out he'd been taken? He received a letter from the government a few days later concerning these mistakes in his tax form. He raised a beef, said he'd already settled with two agents, and... The story came out. Mm -hmm. What about leads on these two men? Uh, just the descriptions Lloyd could give. I've already sent them on to Washington. Now, keep your head down in the water, Nora. Well, I can't open my eyes, Mom. Well, wipe it away with your head. Papa? You a little afraid you're next, Earl? Oh, no, sir. I was just thinking about something. Well, that's good for you, boy. The man who thinks is the man who gets ahead in this old world. I was playing with another boy from the trailer across from us. He's the same age as me. I'm glad to hear you made a friend, Earl. He goes to school, Papa. Just keep that head down. Well, that means they live here at the camp all year round. That means he doesn't travel around like you do. But he goes to school. He doesn't have to see new places. He can read about them. Anybody can read about things, Earl. It's the doing that counts. You just remember that experience is going to teach you a lot more than that boy's going to school will teach him. Now, you run along and play. Can I go back outside? Sure, go on. Only just don't go far. Earl, you come back here. I, I told him he could go on outside, Marty. Herb, I wanted to get that head of his, too. I want to go outside, too. You just take that towel and dry your head, Nora. But Earl didn't have to get his old head washed. You can go out after your hair dries. Here, sit down, Marty. Ah, <sighs> believe it will. Yeah. That's a girl. Herb, this is a real nice camp. Met a woman has a sewing machine in her trailer. Said I could use it any time at all. Well, that's nice, Marty. I wish we could stay here a little while. You've been working so hard, and the government ought to let you have a vacation now and then. It's been almost... Herb, Herb, can I see you outside right away? Why, sure, Fred. Uh, you, you just keep resting, Marty. I'll send Earl in soon. Can I come too, Papa? Not when Uncle Fred and I discuss government business. 
Herb, you know what I found in Clinton's books? Fred, a man's a fool to guess answers when he's got someone right here to tell him. Now get to the point. Clinton claimed $6,340 worth of deductions that we can disallow. Is he still at the hotel? I left him there not 15 minutes ago. Well, wait till I tell Marty I'll be gone for a while. Jim, here's a teletype from Washington answering the descriptions of those two swindlers. Oh, it's a story, Tom. They're suspected of being responsible for a wave of phony tax investigator cases. Uh, here's their record. Thanks. Herb and Fred Grinnell, brothers. Herb has two previous arrests from person. Is there any location on these two, Tom? Their last known address was in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Our field office there checked it, but they'd moved. And there's no indication of where they went. Herb Grinnell's married, has two small children. I wonder if his family's traveling with him. Don't know, Jim, but maybe that uh, Mr. Lloyd they swindled down in West Barrington can give you some additional information. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Well, it's a starting point. I'll get down there. And uh, over here we have a depreciation allowance of 75%. The government only allows 25% on that item, Mr. Clinton. Hmm. Well, I, I just don't understand. I don't know what to say. I, I had no idea. I mean, well, I was certain I could get away with 75%. man next door to me said that he read that I could in the paper. Too many people take the advice of the man next door, Mr. Clinton. Yes, but uh, all these things that you pointed out seem to come to a considerable sum. Quite a considerable sum, Mr. Clinton. $6,340, to be exact. Hmm, well, I had no idea. I mean, I hope that you don't think for a minute that I was purposely trying to, uh, well, uh, cheat the government. The government isn't interested in your motives, Mr. Clinton. It's only interested in getting this matter settled. Yes, but over $6,000. Mr. Clinton, you've been very cooperative. I think we can make a settlement that will please both you and the government. Well, now, I I do appreciate that, and I'm glad that you understand that this was entirely unintentional. Of course, of course. Now, let's see. Six thousand. If we could receive one-third of that promptly, I think we could settle this account right away. Hmm, one-third. That's uh, two thousand. Two thousand dollars. That's right. Well, that sounds reasonable. Very reasonable. You're lucky to live in a country with a very reasonable government, Mr. Clinton. Yeah, <clears throat> true, true. Uh, but look, I'll uh, have to wait until the bank opens tomorrow. I hope that that'll be all right. Oh, no rush, no rush. I imagine the government can get along without your $2,000 for another day, Mr. Clinton. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Very good, very good. Uh, well, come on, Mr. Johnson. We'll uh, drop in around 11 tomorrow, Mr. Clinton. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll have the money waiting. Good night. Uh, good night, and good night to you, sir, Mr. Johnson. Good night. $2,000. Oh, boy, how did you have the nerve to ask for that much? A man has got to see his opportunities, Fred, and when he sees them, don't hesitate. Yeah. You know, Marty had a fine idea today. She said the government should give us a vacation. $2,000 can pay for one swell vacation. Just what I was thinking about. Uh, did you notice those travel folders in the rack beside Mr. Clinton's desk? Yeah, Well, tomorrow, when we go for the money, you pick out one each of those folders. Then we'll pick a really ritzy place for our rest. Oh, and also, remind me to stop at the bank after we get the money. I want to get some of those bills changed into smaller ones. What for? Why, Fred. I'll have to leave Marty and the kids a few dollars to spend while we're gone. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Are you getting the most out of life, or is your life shadowed by fear of the future? Then why not do something about it? Perhaps your problem is the same as Mr. Theodore Aston, and perhaps his experience may help you. Mr. Aston, before you became a member of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, what was your chief worry? I have two youngsters, a boy and a girl, and I wanted them to have a better start in life than I had. And I figured the best way was to give them a good education. What worried me, though, was how I could do that on my salary, or if something happened to me now. 
How did you find the solution to this problem, Mr. Aston? We heard you describe an education plan on this program. That would be the Equitable Education Fund. That's correct. So we called our local Equitable representative. He brought us all the facts and figures, showed us how we could spread the costs for their education over 15 years while they were growing up without putting a dent in our budget. Not only that, if something happened to me, the fund became fully established with no more payments to pay. I'd like to say, too, Mr. Keating, that our local equitable man is a mighty fine man to do business with. He's a real credit to your organization. Yes, I think every member of this audience will find his local equitable man a good man to do business with. He can help you. He wants to help you. He's a specialist, a man who knows insurance from A to Z, and he has your best interests at heart. So just remember, why not decide now to take the fear out of your future? Talk over your plans for future security with the man who can help you best your friendly, helpful, equitable representative. Simply consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Traveling Swindle. In tonight's case, the hotel owner accepting Herb and Fred Grinnell as government agents can certainly be accused of negligence. Your government urges each citizen to check his tax return carefully before filing it to avoid mistakes. But when a mistake is made, a Treasury representative will contact you, show the proper identification, then proceed to show you just where the mistake was made. In no case will you be asked to rectify this mistake by immediately handing this representative any sum of money. In most cases, should the mistake require additional payment on your part, you will be presented with a bill from the Treasury Department. And should you disagree about the alleged mistake, you are free to appeal to your local tax collector's office, and your case will be given a thorough hearing. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. It is the following day. Thomas, Jim Taylor. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Mr. Lloyd identified the Grinnells as the two men who swindled him here in West Barrington. Did he know where they were staying? No, but after I checked the hotels and rooming houses without finding them, I I found a gas station on Highway 30 where they had stopped. They were living in a trailer. Did you check the trailer camps in that area yet? Yeah, Yeah, I found out where they had been staying, but they'd moved on. Owner of the camp was out, but I left a message for him to call me here. Now, what about their car? Well, it was a 40 or 41 sedan. No one could remember the make or the license number. I did find out that Herb Grinnell has his wife and two kids. Excuse me, Tom, will you? The other phone's ringing. Taylor? Yes, sir? That's right. Yes, we're very interested in locating them. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, go on. All right, sir. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Tom, that was the trailer camp owner. Huh? The Grinnells asked him how the highway was west of here. Next town west is Marysville. I think I'll check the trailer camps there. Now, Marty, don't you worry. This government job will only keep us away a week or so. But $60, Herb, we won't need that much. It's not a matter of needing, Marty. It's a matter of deserving. Now, I want you and the kids to enjoy yourselves and have a nice time while we're gone. Uh, All right, Fred, let's go. Right. You take care of yourself, Herb. Don't work too hard. All right, Marty, and don't you worry. Goodbye. Here we go. Mm-hmm. A week of rest and a man's mind is as good as new. Where Fred. are the travel folders, Fred? I put them in the glove compartment. Well, now, let's see what we have here. How much do you figure we can spend, Herb? Oh, maybe half. That way we save half and we can't go wrong. A man who saves half of what he has never has to want. Uh, any of those folders look good? Yeah, here's one from Lake Sterling that sounds nice. Quiet, luxurious, and not too far from here. Yes, sir, I think it's just what we want. 
Let me see the folder. I'll stick it in my pocket. You can read it on the train. You think it'll be really ritzy? Ten dollars a day. Wow. We'll park the car at the railroad station. Wouldn't look so good to drive up there in this jalopy. Ten dollars a day. That comes to seventy dollars a week just for a room. Oh. Herb, maybe if you were to flash that badge at the end of our stay, maybe we Fred, could you... this is a vacation. There's a time for work and a time for play. Oh. He who takes each in his stride will live a richer life. That's my sentiment. Hello there. Hi. You live in that trailer over there? Mm-hmm. Is your daddy home? Uh-uh, Papa's away. But Mama's home, though. Oh, then maybe I can speak to her. I'll take you over if you'll take hold of my hand. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you a friend of my Papa's? No, not exactly. My Uncle Fred? No. Nope. Don't you have any friends? Yes. I'd like you to be one of them. Hmm. Well, here's the trailer. My name's Nora. You just knock and my mama will come. I have to go and find Earl. I love you. Thank you, Nora. Yes? Mrs. Grinnell, my name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. May I come in? Oh, why, of course. You, you must want to see Herb. Yes, ma'am, I do. Come in. I'm sorry my husband isn't here now. Mr. Taylor, is it? Yes, that's right. Mr. Grinnell will be back shortly? Oh, I'm afraid he won't be. He's working on a job, and it might take over a week. Mm -hmm. Is uh, Fred Grinnell with your husband? Why, yes. They've been assigned to work as a team. Do you have any idea where they've gone? No, Herb didn't say. They just finished up that job in Marysville at the Star Hotel, and... And this assignment came up so sudden, Herb didn't have a chance to tell me. You know what year and make your husband's automobile is? Why, certainly. It's a 41 Plymouth. And would you happen to know the license number? I didn't, till Herb made me memorize it. U9077T. U Herb uh, says there's so many people around to steal automobiles, you have to know the number so you can report it right away to the police. Mrs. Grinnell, your husband hasn't been telling you the truth about his work. I don't understand what you mean, Mr. Taylor. I'm sure Herb's told me all he can. Well, your husband and his brother are not government agents. What? They're wanted for impersonating federal officers. Mr. Taylor, I... I bet Herbie's put you up to this old joke. Or maybe it was Fred. No, it's no joke, ma'am. I'm sorry. Mama! Mama, Earl pushed me down and I skinned my knee. Mama... You come on over here, honey. I'll fix it. Don't you cry. Swindled? But I... I can't understand. I gave them $2,000. Well, you should have checked their credentials, Mr. Clinton. Yes, but how was I to know that they weren't government men? Well, that was the only way to know if they were or not. Yes, but... Uh, $2,000. Gone. Well, I'm sorry it had to happen, but if you'll cooperate, we'll do all we can to locate and apprehend them. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Anything, anything. Uh, what can I do? Well, now, in conversation, did these men make any statements that might give us a clue as to where they've gone? Hmm, let me see. Uh, yes, yes, they mentioned something about taking a vacation. Uh -huh. I remember because one of them took some folders from that rack right over there. Well, they didn't say where they were going, did they? No. Uh -huh. Well, thanks, Mr. Clinton. I'll let you know just as soon as we've apprehended the Grinnells. Yes, yes, indeed. I'd appreciate that. I... Oh, $2,000. Jim. Yeah, Tom? Any results on the Grinnell case? I sent out an alarm on the car. Police at the large nearby resort centers have all been alerted. What about some of the smaller places? This state is full of little resort areas. Yeah, I know, but I'm afraid there are too many to cover in the time we have. Tom. Yes, Jim? They've located the Grinnell car at a railroad station garage about 10 miles from Marysville. Left there yesterday at 1.35. Now, six trains left the station within a half hour, and they all made stops at various resorts. Let's get over to the station. There's 
nothing in the car but these travel folders. What did the ticket seller have to say? He didn't remember the Grinnells. Hey, wait a minute, Tom, all these folders. What about them? Let's get to a phone booth. Good shot, Herb. Put you in a swell position. Your shot. How about that? One good shot doesn't make a good player, Fred, not in croquet. Consistency, that's what counts. Now then. <laughs> There's your ball game. Oh, gee, Herb. <laughs> ah, this is a great week. Good bed, good food, freedom, free people in a free land, the right to do what you want, the right to change your mind if you want. Fred. Yeah, Herb? About changing your mind. You know, maybe that wasn't such a bad idea yours after all. What idea? Using the badge to get out of paying the bill here. Let's go see the manager. Oh, let's play another game. Fred, your manners. That gentleman there seems to be waiting to use the court. Uh, right, sir? Well, I'm sorry, but I haven't got time to play, Mr. Grinnell. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Herbie's got a badge. That's right. This one isn't phony. I also have warrants here for your arrest. Well, now, see here, there, there must be some mistake, young there man. There certainly is, but you've made it, Mr. Grinnell. Shall we go? Herb and Fred Grinnell were found guilty of impersonating federal officers and each was sentenced to three years in a federal penitentiary. Special Agent Taylor was able to locate the Grinnell brothers in tonight's case because of the travel folders found in the glove compartment of their automobile. Taylor called the hotel in Marysville and received a list of all folders sent to the hotel. Checking that list against the folders found in the car, Taylor quickly noticed that all but one of the folders were present. He went to the place advertised in the missing folder, Lake Sterling. Thus, through the diligent efforts of your FBI, the danger of these two impersonators continuing their fraud against unwitting citizens has been eliminated. And as long as there are criminals hiding behind the veil of false identification, the FBI shall continue to do everything in its power to combat this threat. Do you own your own home free and clear? Are your children sure of getting a good education? Are your wife and family protected no matter what? If you say no to any of these questions, then you owe it to yourself to consult your local Equitable Society representative. He will show you how to make your dreams come true and how to enjoy a peace of mind you never knew before. Simply consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, extortion. Its title, The Seagull Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Dick Carr. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Harley Bear, Richard Beals, Walter Catlett, Helen Klebe, Tom Tully, Ann Whitfield, and Carlton Young. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Seagull Shakedown on This Is Your FBI. This program came to you from Hollywood.